Grace and peace to you. Welcome to worship on this first Sunday in Lent. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. May we believe that with our whole hearts. God be with you. At this time, the children can go with Miss Rachel for Sunday school and will return to us at communion. Would you all stand for the call to worship? The prophet asks, can our soul weary bones live again? We ask, can we dance again after mourning, loss, and grief? The gift is sure and unmistakable. Let us celebrate the gift of God's new life. you may be seated. As we enter the Lenten season, it's a time of repentance, and a better way to view that sometimes is a time of telling the truth, the truth about our world, the truth about ourselves, the truth that God is present to make a difference. So full of faith in that truth, just let us turn to confession this morning. For I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me, just against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me.
Friends, for those who are baptized in Christ, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Jesus Christ, the same Lord, is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And may the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you. And now you may stand up and share the peace by waving across the aisles. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to Second Congregational First Presbyterian Church, where our mission is to energize downtown Rockford and beyond with God's grace. My name is Katie Patterson. It's my honor and privilege to serve our church as moderator. Don't forget next Sunday to spring ahead, get your clocks turned ahead so you're here on time for church. We have several things coming up to, uh, for Lent. One thing is our Wednesday night suppers are back. Soup at 6 o'clock. Worship here in the sanctuary at 6.30. Starting this Thursday at 12.05 to 12.50, Sandy Williams will be doing meditations. This will be by Zoom. Easter flowers, are the orders are due by March 15th. Details about ordering them and what color and what kind you want are all in the bulletin. Fair Trade Store will be open after church this Sunday. And also next Sunday is the Chop Challenge. If you've never watched this on TV, this will be our version of Chop Challenge. Uh, members of the Family Christian Ed Board will be out in the South Narthex after church to sign you up. It will be both kids and adults. So see you next Sunday. Thank you.
We, uh, we continue to walk through the Gospel of John, and today we see a pretty famous story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who will anoint the Lord with perfume and wipe his feet with her hair, and her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, through Jesus, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, to the Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let, let, us, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Your brother will rise again. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Where have you laid him? Lord, Lord come, come and, and see. see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and the stone was lying against it. Take away the stone. Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead for four days. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away, and Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, 
I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you that you meet us where we are in the midst of this world that's full of turmoil and grief and death. I thank you that you are the life and the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I can be as anxious as anyone for a package to arrive, but we had a funny experience this week. I wanted to order some new vitamins, and they were cheaper from a box store that we don't typically shop at. And as I was ordering, I said to Andy, do we need anything else? Oh yeah, soap. So I put a few bars of soap and placed the order. The vitamins arrived first in their own box through the mail. A day later, three bars of soap showed up in a plastic bag on the doorstep. Someone had driven to our house to drop off three bars of soap. We thought that was as ridiculous as the driver probably did, too. I wasn't paying too much attention to the soap, but then the next day, the FedEx truck pulled up in front of our house and dropped off one bar of soap in a plastic envelope. I didn't need the four bars of soap to come this week. We could have waited until next, but somehow the world runs and rushes and races to meet our collective impatience at the expense of our sanity and the health of our planet. Impatient we typically are. Soap is inconsequential compared to human life, of course. Our test of true patience is really on display when a loved one is sick or waiting for a test result. Mary and Martha send word to Jesus that their brother Lazarus is sick. And this doesn't sound like an urgent request to come. But Jesus knows that he already isn't just sick. He tells the disciples that Lazarus is sleeping, which they, of course, take literally and think he's just taking a little nap. And Jesus is like, um, he's dead. Thomas, oh, doubting Thomas, says, let's go so that we can all die. Now, I'm making light of Thomas's drama. The authorities were really after Jesus already. Thomas knew that going back to Bethany and doing another sign would really draw too much attention. And he was right. Raising Lazarus was Jesus' seventh and last sign in the Gospel of John. You would think that Jesus would run to this family that he loves. He would say, hold my beer and just be on his way. But he doesn't. He casually stays two more days teaching and preaching and being among the people. This tests everyone's patience. By the time Jesus gets to Bethany... Martha comes out to meet him first. It doesn't say that they cussed at him or were super mad at him, but you know that she was and that she had some choice words for, her, for him. Lazarus was her only brother, probably the link to her livelihood and, one, and the one that Jesus loves. You know that she wanted to say, where the bleep have you been? But she doesn't. She asks where Jesus has been, but then says, I know God will give you what you ask, begging for Jesus to still do something. Jesus says, your brother will live. And Martha's like, I know, I know. How many theological conversations have we had? I know that he will rise again on the last day. Martha is also again taking Jesus one way, and Jesus means another But here, Jesus doesn't correct her. 
He doesn't say, Martha, it'll be okay. I'm about to do a thing and bring him back. No, he engages her thoughts and her faith. We all need something different in grief. And Martha needed to talk, to be reassured, to be comforted with words. Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asks Martha. Does she believe this? Wow, yes, she does. A couple commentaries I read suggested this passage should be called the confession of Martha and not the raising of Lazarus. She replies, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Martha is the one who gets Jesus to say, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And Jesus is not necessarily talking at face value here because, yes, everyone will die. But Jesus is saying, there is more. Yes, we will die, and then we will all live. But first, there is death. And it's completely depressing and painful. I was reading about the national parks this week, and I'm a big fan of any park, whether Rockford Park District's smallest park or the largest national park, which I looked up is in Alaska, if you're wondering. How the parks came to be is inspiring and mesmerizing, but it's not true for everyone. John Paris writes of a valley in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. He says even though the land no longer belongs to them, they keep coming back. The Caldwells, the Hannas, the Palmers, the Rogers, the Woodies, for their roots go deep in the Cataloochee soil. They have a story and a legend for every foot of ground. But the land is no longer theirs because they were forced to leave so that the national parks could be born. Every summer they return, walk the familiar trails, and look to see what remains of the last house standing and the old little church. They sing and worship there and have dinner on the ground. It's a highlight and a joy and also a reminder of what was lost. We live in this place of in-between, between bitter and sweet. We live in the place where there is hopelessness and grief. We live in the place where Lazarus dies. And in the midst of a senseless war, during the second year of a pandemic, I don't need to remind you of that. When Mary came where Jesus was, she didn't want to do a lot of talking like her sister. She was weeping. She too said, if you had been here, Jesus, Lazarus would not have died. It says, Jesus was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And Jesus wept. Jesus wept in all his humanity, empathizing with our pain, knowing what lay ahead of him. Jesus wept. For the proper response sometimes is just to sit down and cry. And he is crying. And as he's crying, Jesus said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, What Jesus said when he called them into discipleship, when he called them to have faith, come and see. Avoiding the grief, avoiding looking at what is painful and hard, while might seem like a good idea in the moment, always comes back to be worse on later. Come and see. Jesus had to go and see where Lazarus was. Jesus had to out himself again as the Son of God, the one whom God listens to, the one whom would do the last sign in deep and desperate hope that we would believe. Come and see. When Daisy Bates was a young tot, her mother was murdered by a group of white men. She could have sat right in the middle of her grief and weeping for the rest of her life. She would have been justified in doing so, and no one would have blamed her. But she didn't. 
in the spirit of new life, in the hope of the resurrection, with the confidence there would be a better and brighter day, Daisy Bates with her husband began a newspaper, the Arkansas State Press. She became an activist in the civil rights movement. She was in the right time and the right place to support the Little Rock Nine as they integrated an all-white school. Daisy Bates knew how to come and see. Through her constant action and attention, Jesus revealed new life and resurrection to a whole generation of Americans. When Jesus finally gets to the tomb, and it's probably appropriate here to put finally in all caps, when he finally gets to Lazarus' tomb, it's been four days. And at this point, even Martha is like, Dude, Jesus, do you know how bad it's going to smell when we open up that rock? Like, seriously, do you want to do this? The King James Version of the Bible says, He stinketh. But Jesus points his face to heaven, gives thanks to God for the sake of those around him, and asks for the rock to be rolled away. And then Jesus calls to Lazarus, to come out. Lazarus staggers out, wrapped in strips of grave cloths, even around his face. And Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. That's the end of the story. Unbind him and let him go. Too often we get bound in our grave clothes, wrapped in hopelessness and despair overcome by grief and doubt. How could we not as we think about all that is happening in this world? But Jesus is constantly with us, sometimes offering new life and resurrection with words, sometimes just weeping with us, but always with the command to be unbound and set free. In the midst of your grief and hardship, May you come and see the life of Christ, and may you be unbound and set free. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our life can be full of heartache and tragedy. Life can be hard. We can feel like we are bound with grave clothes. And yet God says, come out to be unbound and set free. And it is at this table where Jesus sets us free. Because we don't have it in ourselves to be set free alone. We can't do this with all of our energy, even if we have the deepest faith and the best prayers. We need the living, loving Lord to be the life and the resurrection. We need the living, loving Lord to set us free. And that is who we meet in this meal. This is not a UCC table or a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table and all who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, are invited to come. So whether you are feeling full of faith or full of doubt, come. Whether you are feeling bound or set free, come. Whether you are feeling full of hope or despair, come. For this is the Lord's table set for you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Let us pray. We offer our thanks and praise, O God, for the glories of creation, for the black velvet of the night that allows the stars to twinkle and the moon to glow, for the sun that peeks over the horizon and paints the sky as it sets, We offer our thanks and praise for the heavens and the saints of heaven for the cloud of witnesses. Blessed are you, Holy One, and blessed are your Son, Jesus Christ, the light of this world. 
Born in the stillness of night, he knew the love of family and stranger alike. Threatened by evil, he fled to a distant land. Endowed with the Spirit, he taught about grace and forgiveness, and he healed the sick and confronted the powerful. And humility, humility and in trust, he laid down his life that he might raise again and bring new life to the world. For the gifts of his life and presence, we give you thanks and ask for one more thing, that your spirit descend now upon us, upon this table, that the bread we break and the cup we share would be transformed from their ordinariness to sacred things. As we share one loaf and one cup, may we become one with the world, bringing good news to all. And hear us now as we boldly say together the words Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was to be arrested, he sat with his friends and disciples as he had so many nights before. But on this night, he took the bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. Saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this, remembering me. And in the same manner after supper, Jesus took the cup and he poured it out, saying, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes to make all things right and new. With our COVID protocol still in place, you should have received a piece of gluten-free bread and a cup of non-alcoholic grape juice, or perhaps you at home have prepared your own elements or know that these words are enough to bind you into this table with us. Come, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us receive. Have all been served who wish to be served? Let us pray. God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of this table. Thank you for binding all of us together in your Holy Spirit through time and place. Take our lives, O oh God, and make us yours. Send us out into this world to be your people and to do your work and your ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This is from Deuteronomy 26, verse 2. You shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God has given you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. It is right to give to all in need. It is right to give to the work of the church. Let us now receive today's offering. Let us pray. 
We share our gratitude for all of our fruits, from our processions to knowledge and from our time to abilities. May our best be something that we do not hoard, but that we freely give away. As we embrace this season of fasting and reflection, may we rec recognize the best of our talents, our treasures, and our time, and share with God and neighbor. Amen. are unbound and free. Go into the world to see that Christ is a, the life and the resurrection. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>